On the next Great Lakes Now, the city takes action to protect its salamanders and creates an attraction. Two, three hundred people at a time walking around, staring at the ground, looking at salamanders. Can Great Lakes ports help with backups on the coasts? The companies that need to move these goods, they're now asking, why can't we get a ship into Cleveland? And news from around the lakes. Well, hello there and welcome to another Great Lakes Now Facebook and YouTube live episode sneak peek watch party. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Anna Seisling, producer with Great Lakes Now, and I'm also excited to welcome our other watch party co-hosts. Let's pull up that map graphic as I list everybody off. So, of course, we have Detroit Public Television. We have WNMU TV PBS in Marquette, Michigan. We have WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania. We have PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio. We have WPBS TV in Watertown, New York, Milwaukee PBS, a new cross-posting partner, WNIT Michiana PBS. They are in South Bend, Indiana. Michigan Learning Channel, Tara at Detroit Public Television, and our Great Lakes Now News Collaborative Partner, Circle of Blue, and we are also streaming on our Great Lakes Now YouTube channel. All right, so we've got a really great lineup of guests joining us a little bit later in the watch party, and they are going to answer your questions and talk about all kinds of Great Lakes critters and how they fit into the ecosystem. Of course, you might have gotten a little bit of a taste of what we're going to be diving into us. Uh, especially tonight, which is blue spotted salamanders. And as always, I'm really excited to bring your voice into the conversation tonight. So please feel free to drop us a line in the chat and let us know where you are watching from. And of course, if you have any questions about blue spotted salamanders or other Great Lakes amphibians, or if there's a certain species, uh, maybe a critter in your Great Lakes community that you think is worthy of celebrating, I would love to work all of those comments into the conversation. So be sure to drop those into the chat. But first, let's check out this episode sneak peek watch party segment. And that is March of the Salamanders. In at least one way, salamanders are like chickens. They too cross the road to get to the other side. And in Presque Isle Park on the shores of Lake Superior in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, the city of Marquette is helping the salamanders make their journey safely. I really like when I start to see one move and then they'll freeze. They just woke up and they need a cup of coffee. So they take a break and then they'll start moving again and crossing the road. Kathleen Henry is the special projects coordinator with the Superior Watershed Partnership. We have people coming out at all hours in the middle of the night in, the, in rain to observe uh, the salamanders moving. and. For the most part, everyone's been super, super respectful and very engaged and wanting to learn more about the salamanders. And not just any salamanders, blue spotted salamanders. Crawling across a road at night in the rain is what they do every spring at Presque Isle Park in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Measuring three to five inches long, these salamanders have a stout body with a broad head and wide mouth. Dr. Jill Leonard heads the biology department at Northern Michigan University. So these animals, um, they will thaw out from winter and they will start walking through the snow actually um, to get to their natal pond, which for us is the bog um, that's right across the road. That bog is where the salamanders meet up, lay eggs and reproduce. After three or four days in the bog, the salamanders cross back over the road hide under logs or burrow into the ground. These four-legged amphibians have been following this same pattern for thousands of years, since long before there were roads here. And this road is closed for them now, largely because of this guy, Eli Beery. Here's the main cabin, and I will take you above deck. The sun's just rising. This is home. <laughs> Beery is a Fulbright scholar currently living on a sailboat while doing research into amphibians in Australia. But about four years ago, he was an undergrad biology student at Northern Michigan University in Marquette. While studying there, he routinely took walks through the woods on rainy nights 
with some fellow biology students looking for salamanders. And then this one night at Presque Isle Park, we were blown away when we saw like truly hundreds of salamanders crossing the road at the same time. Um, and that was really incredible until a car started coming by and squishing the salamanders. Beery and his advisor, Dr. Jill Leonard, developed a research plan and found that up to 20% of the salamanders were being killed by cars. At that rate, the local salamander population would eventually go extinct. So just exactly how many blue spotted salamanders live in the Presque Isle area? Scientists don't know for sure. But I can tell you it's certainly in the thousands. One of the things that we're working on through a citizen science project is really to try to census how many individuals are crossing the road. It sounds like a joke to do with chickens, but how many salamanders cross the road will really help us understand the population size here. Beery says the blue spotted salamander plays a vital role in the local ecosystem, eating insects and providing food for other animals. Foxes, birds, snakes, other amphibians, pretty much everything eats salamanders. They're actually a really good indicator species to, to indicate ecosystem health uh, because if there's an issue with the soil or the air or the water, salamanders will be the first to be affected. In the course of his research, Beery discovered something interesting about some of the salamanders at Presque Isle. Some of them have what he called funky genetics. We noticed that some of the females in the population were much, much larger than they normally are, two to three times larger, and their pattern is a little different. Normally they're a really dark, almost black color with the little blue spots, but these females were almost completely patternless and like a slate gray color. And there was something else a bit strange about some of the salamanders. Yeah, we figured out that their unisexual population of all female that actually cloned themselves through a process called parthenogenesis. You know, most people never even see a salamander in their lifetime, and yet they're fabulous. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to watch them walking across a, a snowbank in the middle of the wintertime. Eli's research convinced the city of Marquette to shut down the stretch of road used by the salamanders during the spring migration, and the road closure got a lot of people interested. Two, three hundred people at a time, walking around, staring at the ground, looking at salamanders. It sounds a little crazy, I know, but it's actually really amazing. The city of Marquette is now hosting Salamander Days events every spring. Mayor Jenna Smith admits she wasn't a big fan of the little critters at first. But I've come to learn about their place here in our community and I really enjoy Salamander Days now. I've come full circle on salamanders, so I really appreciate that now we're embracing our culture and celebrating with art. Longtime resident and artist Dan Barrington was one of the people who came up with the idea for the annual event at his retirement party. We were just talking and I said, I think it'd be great if there was salamander days. And what I imagined was like a spring festival and the salamander would be the centerpiece. Barrington's plywood rendition of the blue spotted salamander took up residence outside City Hall and on the front steps of the Superior Watershed Partnership office. What I was thinking of is something along this line, which would be a bigger, like a two by 10 and two by 12 and some legs, just simple representation, painted up because I've done something like that before. Tina Morin is the arts and culture manager in Marquette. The Children's Museum did art-inspired salamanders activities. Our local brewery, Black Rocks, made a special salamander session beer that was on tap for the migration period. And there was plenty of salamander art. The best of show winner was Susan Estler, who worked with enamel and copper to come up with her creation took a silhouette of one of the salamanders. When I was looking at photos of it, I thought this is just the perfect medium to represent the salamanders because he looks like a real salamander. People of all ages submitted artwork and a few of the outstanding artists were honored at City Hall. The migration of salamanders, we thought, well, that's a wonderful opportunity for people to really consider the salamander, think about uh, its habitat, learn more about it to do that through art.
I think that this project is a great example and could be used to encourage individuals to look to their local migratory species, whether that be salamanders or turtles or, or whatnot, um, and see in their local area what could be done to conserve those species in your local areas. I think if you're in Marquette or really anywhere in the Great Lakes region and it's a warm, rainy spring night, go out with a flashlight because you never know what you're gonna find. They're all around and it's totally worth seeing. Thanks for watching. For more on these stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. That is really the kind of story that just brings a smile to my face, I have to say. So before we start unpacking everything that we just saw and talking with our guests, I want to make sure that we drop a link to the landing page for the July episode into the chat. There's lots of cool extras and links along with a map, lots of cool things related to that segment and the other segments that are a part of our latest episode titled Salamanders, Shipping, and Shorelines. All right, so now I'm really excited to welcome our guests. Um, but before we do that, I do want to just remind you that if you are out in the viewing audience tonight and you want to let me know where you are watching from, maybe you have a question about blue spotted salamanders already teed up from watching that segment, or maybe you have another cool um, reptile, amphibian, some other Great Lakes critter that you think is worthy of celebrating that calls your community home. Let us know that too. I'm always excited to work your comments into the conversation. All right, so now I'm excited to welcome our guests. First up, we have Eli Beery. You might recognize him from the segment that we just saw. Eli is a Fulbright scholar currently living on a sailboat while doing research into amphibians in Australia. About four years ago, Beery was an undergrad biologist student at Northern Michigan University and Marquette, Michigan, where he studied the blue spotted salamander. Eli, so good to have you with us. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. Absolutely. We also have Kathleen Henry, who's a special projects coordinator and education specialist for the Superior Watershed Partnership. Colleen, a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks. Happy to be here. Absolutely. And then we have Tina Morin, who is the Arts and Culture Manager in Marquette, Michigan. She oversees and helps organize community celebrations centered on the Blue Spotted Salamander. Welcome, Tina. Hi, thanks. Yep. All right. So let's go back to Eli and get started with uh, with some of the interview questions that I have. So you, like we heard in, in the segment that we just saw, thousands of blue spotted salamanders living in Michigan's Presque Isle Park, they once had a real problem. And that's every spring, the amphibians would crawl to a nearby swamp to lay their eggs, but a paved road stood in their path and a lot of them were being crushed by passing cars. So I'm curious, I mean, we saw how you kind of identified that this is happening and then sought a solution, but how did you even discover that this was happening in the first place, Eli? Yeah, so actually just kind of stumbled upon it. Um, some friends and I went out to find salamanders one night. And normally when you do something like that, you're expecting to see just a few. Um, and we were, we were pretty shocked when we saw hundreds. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it really was just kind of a, a, a chance thing, but we knew that it was, it was something special and, and worth looking more into. Mm -hmm. And then once, at what point did you realize like, okay, there's a potential for a lot of this population to be decimated. We need to do something. Um, like talk a little bit about how you kind of went from recognizing this is a problem as a college student, which like, I mean, I remember back in my college days, I wasn't necessarily the most um, astute at navigating like local politics and trying to reach out to the authorities, you know, to try to create some new, um, some new kind of workaround for a species. So once you identified that this was happening, can you talk a little bit about sort of what your process was like around, you know, letting the officials in Marquette know this was happening? Right. Yeah. So, well, first we had to do the research um, and compile evidence to, you know, we really didn't know, is this does this warrant any mitigation? Like, should we close the road? How many are actually dying? So once we had the numbers, um, at that point, this is where the Superior Watershed came in. It was really helpful, uh, kind of being a middleman between between us and the city. Um, so I spoke at a couple of city council events and uh, Parks and Rec, and luckily the, the city was just so receptive um, and people got really excited about salamanders. And I think that like just goes to show 
what a great community Marquette is. Absolutely. And also just the ways that I think it was really um, kind of skillfully, the the salamanders were really skillfully, I think, kind of presented to the community as this opportunity for celebration and community solidarity. Um, Eli, I want to come back to you and ask you a little bit about the work that you've been doing in the years since then. But now I'd like to bring in Kathleen, uh, Kathleen Henry, Special Projects Coordinator and Education Specialist with the Superior Watershed Partnership. So um, Kathleen, speak to a little bit about what Eli was saying just in terms of the salamander species. So Eli was doing research on this species. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what is special or unique about the blue spotted salamander and sort of how they fit into the ecosystem in northern Michigan. Yeah, um, I think salamanders, well, in general, you know, they, they are an indicator species, so you could tell a lot about the health of an ecosystem. They provide a lot of ecosystem services, such as eating insects like mosquitoes, <laughs> and then also they are consumed too. Um, but I would say something that's more so special about the blue spotted salamander is the way that it has brought um, the community together, community partnerships through Eli and Tina at the Office of Arts and Culture um, and a local nonprofit, the Superior Watershed Partnership. Cool. Um, and then, you know, something too that I was kind of hoping that we might be able to touch on. I have been hearing this um, just more and more, especially in my time with Great Lakes now, about species that are able to um, kind of reproduce on their own. So I'm wondering if you can talk, can you talk about that at all, about these female salamanders that are able to essentially clone themselves? Is this something that's pretty common within amphibians? Yeah, I think actually um, Eli would be the person to talk to about the okay. uh, the female uh, salamanders <laughs> on Presque Isle. Um, so okay, I'll Eli, I'll, I'll put that question to you then, Eli. Yeah, it's it's really strange. Um, so this process of self-cloning called parthenogenesis is really rare in the animal kingdom. You see it in plants pretty frequently, um, but to have it in a vertebrate species like a salamander is pretty strange. Um, but, but they do these self-cloning females do occur around the Great Lakes. Um, and this population we identified in Marquette is the first known population in the UP. Fascinating. We have a question coming in on Facebook from Elizabeth um, from Arbor Vitae, Wisconsin. We have several vernal ponds on our property, but how will we know just when the salamanders are on the move in the spring? Um, Kathleen, Eli, do either of you have a preference around trying to answer that one? Yeah, I mean, I'll go first. I would say salamanders really like um, moist conditions and the blue spotted salamander, especially at night, um, will be on the move in rainy conditions a little a little bit when it's colder. But in the springtime, um, typically you can see salamanders if you uh, check underneath a log. But yeah, they really need some forest area and then some wetland areas as well. Okay. Um, we also have some people uh, chiming in. Uh, we have a YouTuber watching from Green Bay, and we have Bonnie, who is tuned in on YouTube Live, watching from Gross Point Woods in Michigan. Um, and feel free to let us know if you're tuned in as well, where you are watching from, if you have questions for our experts about blue spotted salamanders, or if there is a critter, an amphibian, a reptile species uh, in your Great Lakes community that you think is worthy of celebration, feel free to drop that into the chat, and I'll be sure to work it in to to the conversation. Uh, we have a comment coming in from YouTube that says, this is so much fun. I'm happy you think so. I would have to agree. Um, all right. So now I want to welcome Tina into the conversation. Um, so Tina, we saw in that segment so much community celebration and involvement um, around really lifting up the blue spotted salamander species and using it as kind of a real opportunity for community celebration, solidarity. Um, Talk a little bit about, from your view, how the community has come to embrace these amphibians and kind of the first signs that you saw that this was something that the community could really come together on. Well, um, I work for the Office of Arts and Culture for the city. And so part of my job is to uh, engage people through the arts um, with uh, city issues and challenges. And of course, um, when the crossing of the blue spotted salamander um, we've always, we've known that's been a, a thing for a while, and I was so lucky to have a community member come in and suggest the idea. Well, we all loved it. City management loved it as well. And we're like, let's do this. And um, actually, Superior Watershed Park uh, offices are located right where the uh, Salamander Crossing is on an over 300 acre park, which is Presque Isle. And so it was a great partnership. Um, Superior Watershed Partnership uh, works with the arts a lot as a tool really to engage um, 
the arts are a great tool to engage people with uh, uh, just participation and education and get people aware. I mean, I think that's why one of the reasons this show became aware and Detroit Free Press did an article is because we had the Salamander Days event. And um, I, I think it was a way for instead of just going out and look, looking at them or hearing about them in the radio or watching um, a show about them, people could engage. They mm -hmm. could draw a picture. They could take an art class and learn about scientific illustration. So, you know, arts were a great way to bring uh, education about the salamander um, and give people an opportunity to get involved and hopefully more empathy. And uh, I think uh, it's exciting that there's so much excitement around such a small creature it gives me hope that there'll be excitement with the arts around even um you know other things this is the tip of the iceberg for us mm -hmm. and there's been so much excitement you know the black rocks brewery had a beer and the children's museum and all of these different uh groups that worked with us so next year we already have ideas coming from the community a parade a giant salamander a salamander ball Oh uh, so uh, definitely uh, want to use this opportunity to learn more about our environment, um, climate change, and use the arts uh, to do this. It's, it's proven very effective. And I wanted to show you the salamander. I grabbed it when you were talking. Oh, my it's God. So big, the one that Dan Barrington made, it won't even, its head is way over there. I can't even oh, show my God. It's so big. Oh, that big, though. <laughs> Perfect. There it is. All there right. Is. Yeah. Great. So I, I kind of want to bring uh, Kathleen back into the mix because, you know, I'm thinking that the I kind of would love to hear the synergy that exists between City of Marquette and the Superior Watershed. Um, I'm really interested in, Tina, kind of what you were saying about how these artistic opportunities are also allowing the community a greater chance at kind of developing empathy and scientific literacy. And I'm wondering, Kathleen, if you're also noticing that from your view um, in the ways that the community has built up programming around the blue spotted salamanders, are you noticing a difference in um, the people that you engage with with the Superior Watershed? Definitely. Yeah. Well, I think in general, the arts play a really important role in education um, and specifically with the salamander days. Uh, the goal was to increase awareness. Um, and so it was about stewardship more so than anything. And you know, when individuals were coming out at night to watch the salamanders move <laughs> across the road, um, there was the citizen science project that was happening. And so everyone, they might not have known that uh, we were collecting data. Um, so the Superior Watership Partnership in Northern Michigan University did a citizen science project monitoring. Um, and, as, you know, someone would come up and they would just want to see the salamanders. But when I would talk to them about the importance of data in collection, um, you could just kind of see their face and was like, wow, this is really cool. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, there's a notes section <laughs> on each of the data sheets. And so many people were just like, thank you. I learned so much. So just taking the time to really observe um, and participate in education. Um, it was really, really awesome to see. And I definitely see that transferring um, more and more now. And even through, you could see through the art projects that were hanging at City Hall too. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So now, Tina, I know that the Salamanders Days, this is typically a spring event. And I think actually we have a link to the most recent 2022 Salamanders Days webpage we can pull up there. But I'm wondering um, if you can just talk and describe that event a little bit, you know, for people who maybe want to start planning their spring trip for the 2023 Salamander Days event. Well, this was actually the first year, and I don't think uh, Kathleen um, or I or the rest of the people that our colleagues that we work with thought it would get this much attention and that we would be most likely budgeting for this next year. Uh, but I, there's been a lot of uh, feedback. So, yes, we're going to do it again. It's important to the community. And uh, I know that there um, are local grade schools that already want to incorporate uh, drawing or painting salamanders. It's a way for science teachers and uh, to engage their students. Um, so the art show, I imagine, is going to be much, much bigger. That The picture that you're looking at right there was actually done by staff member Amelia Pruitt, who um, did a lot of the marketing for Salamander Days, but she also is an artist, and that's a digital painting. Oh, wow. Um, it, she taught a scientific uh, illustration class with our senior arts program, 
and you know, I imagine almost every person in that class has never really thought about how do you draw uh, an amphibian's um, skin mm -hmm. to look that way. You know, you have to really look at them and observe, like Kathleen was saying. So um, I, I'm looking forward to planning with our partners, Watershed, but also Northern. There's other people that are showing interest in partnering with us next year. Mm -hmm. uh, Right now, there, there's no plan except we're enjoying <laughs> the summer up here. And I think the plan is September is to re-engage and um, kind of start planning again for the spring. Okay. And I'm, I'm also curious, and this is maybe a question more for Kathleen. Um, you know, I, I think even just where I'm at in Southeast Michigan, I will notice, and I have seen salamanders moving very slow in the, you know, kind of beginning thawing in the spring season. Um, in Northern Michigan though, I mean, what are the temperatures and the conditions that we're talking about when these salamanders kind of start emerging and doing this, this migratory journey? What it, what's it like outside at that point? Yeah. Uh uh, you know, this year it started when there was it was still snowing, so <laughs> at least 32 degrees, wow. um, and then it kind of sw it switches to freezing rain, um, but definitely still very very cold. But uh, the migration happened from mid March to mid May this year, um, and you know we were able to capture and understand that because of uh, the data collection, which was very exciting. I will also just say, you know, you you don't have to travel very far. Um, depending on where you are in the Great Lakes to see to see salamanders, um, which is the really cool thing about this project. I think I hope that it inspires individuals to look locally to see what's around um, and get involved and observe on a local level. Um, yeah, what's happening cool. in their environment. I think something else really interesting that happened was just the conversations that happened. It wasn't just salamanders mm -hmm. in the UP uh, spring winter is very long. Mm -hmm. And this gave us an opportunity to really think about spring. Our spring is just different than it is downstate and other parts of the United States. The signs are more subtle of spring. And so it was really interesting to talk to different people in the community about what spring means to them, what are signs of spring, and to become more observant with the signs of spring. Um, there were lots of other conversations about other amphibians as well. So a conversation started with this project, and I think um, a lot more people became observant about our signs of spring here in the UP. Tina, I really, really appreciate you bringing forward that aspect around this being kind of an opportunity to hone our attention. I heard something recently um, as an author of a, of a book about the attention economy saying that our attention at this point moves at the speed of Snapchat. And that kind of just broke my heart. So I think opportunities um, to notice those kind of subtle nuances of our ecosystem and our environment, and of course, to engage with the species um, outside of ourselves, I think it's just, mm -hmm. these are so such um, such precious aspects of what it means to be alive, really. Um, so, Eli, I'd love to bring you back in, our most far-flung guest to date. Eli's out on the boat <laughs> in Australia holding it down for us. So, Eli, this was years ago at this point for you, and you are continuing your educational career. Talk a little bit about what you what you learned from those blue-spotted salamanders in terms of kind of creating the, um, the infrastructure and the awareness and everything that you kind of did with those blue-spotted salamanders and how that that's informed um, the work that, and the research that you've continued to do. Yeah, I think one of the big takeaways I had from this project was just the importance in bridging kind of that gap between science and policy. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to do science, but if you're not communicating the science and making effective changes, um, you're you're losing a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm glad Kath Kathleen mentioned um, citizen science because. Uh, I'm actually working on a citizen science project now in Australia where smartphone users uh, can download an app and record frog calls all around Australia. And it's just become this hugely popular um, app. And it's it's a really powerful data set when we have thousands and thousands of people recording this data. Very cool. What's the name of that app? It's called Frog ID. Frog ID. All right. We will try to get that into the chat for people who are interested in learning more about Eli's work. All right, everybody. Well, it is about that time to wrap up another edition of the Great Lakes Now episode sneak peek watch party. And even though you already got to see the March of the Salamanders segment, there are two other really excellent segments in the July episode of Great Lakes Now. One is about shipping constraints in the Great Lakes and beyond. And of course, we have the catch, which is our new regular feature with bite-sized news briefs about the lakes you love. I hope you'll check it out. 
on your local PBS station or on YouTube. And again, we will be sure to drop the link into the landing page for you in the chat so you can check out that July episode and all the cool extras and segments and everything else you need to know. And I'm already really excited to come back with you next month as we sneak peek our August episode. And I'd like to bring back my guests and give them a warm thanks again. We have Eli Beery, a Fulbright scholar, currently living on a sailboat while doing research into amphibians in Australia. Eli, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. And we have Tina Morin, who is the arts and culture manager holding it down in Marquette, Michigan. She oversees and helps uh, and helps to organize community celebrations centered on the blue spotted salamanders. Tina, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. It was fun. And then we have Kathleen Henry, a special projects coordinator and education specialist for the Superior Watershed Partnership. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. And a big thank you to our co-host for this watch party. We can pull up that map graphic again as I list everybody off. We have Detroit Public Television, WNMU-TV, PBS in Marquette, Michigan. We have WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania, PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio, WPBS-TV in Watertown, New York, Milwaukee PBS, WNIT Michiana PBS in South Bend, Indiana, Michigan Learning Channel, Tara at Detroit Public Television, and our Great Lakes News Collaborative partner, Circle of Blue, and we are also streaming on our Great Lakes Now YouTube channel. I'd also like to say thanks to our wonderful team at Detroit Public Television. We have Tammy Winsell, Sandra Svoboda, Colleen O'Donnell, Mila Murray, Tynetta Harris, Jordan Wingrove, Rob Green, and Lana Contardi. Thank you so much for tuning in to another Great Lakes Now Watch Party. And until next time, we will see you out on the lakes.